Okay, uh, we have a jam-packed schedule here today, so let's get started. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, for those that have, have attended a Worktango webinar in the past, you're probably used to seeing my co-founder, Rob Catalano. Um, Rob's away this week. He's taking some time to relax and recharge. So you have me for uh, today's session uh, to introduce our speakers. Uh, my name is Nader Ibrahim. I'm the other co-founder here at Worktango. Um, for those of you who have not heard of Wartango, our passion, if you can see it, is on my chest here. It's to improve work lives. We do this by helping organizations give their people a voice, and we do that through anonymous employee feedback. And we take all that employee feedback and data that we collect and provide insights back to leaders and organizations at all levels. In our work over the years, we've always seen diversity, equity, inclusion uh, be a big part of people-first workplaces. One of the things that we're seeing um, that, that's different today is really around awareness, and it's awareness around inequities, discrimination, harassment, microaggressions towards mar marginalized groups that has risen. And we're seeing it everywhere. You know, if you look specifically at the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and how it, it's shed light on all the injustices that exist in our society, in our systems, in our workplaces, um, and that's been a big catalyst for, uh, for some of the awareness that we're seeing today. While many employers in the workplace have created policies to address some of these issues, that alone isn't sufficient. Um, a recent study by TELUS focused on LGBTQ2 plus inclusion at work found that 57%, almost 60% of respondents felt that they, they couldn't fully come out at work. And a quarter of them felt worried about hostile work environments. And those are just two small data points um, that show that there's so much work to be done all around in the space. So today's webinar is specifically on that. It's on how HR and people leaders can create an LGBTQ2 plus inclusive workplace culture. And it's being led by our partners at Feminuity. And I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Feminuity and Dr. Sarah Saska on a number of projects over the past few years. And one thing I could say about her and the entire team at Feminuity is that they genuinely care. They wake up every day thinking about how they can help their clients build more diverse teams, equitable systems, and inclusive cultures. So uh, we're so pleased to be here today. And we're going to chat about how HR and people leaders can create an LGBTQ2+. Um, inclusive workplace culture. Um, and I have, uh, I'm joined by one of our team members, Keith. Keith, do you want to pop your head back in? Awesome. Hello, everyone. So we will introduce ourselves in, in just a moment. But first, uh, I want to pass the, the digital mic, uh, the virtual mic to Keith to kick us off with a land acknowledgement. All right, so we're going to start off with a land acknowledgement with honors uh, Indigenous people's historic and ongoing connection to their traditional territories and allows us to reflect on and uh, grapple with histories of colonization. So with that saying, with that being said, uh, Feminuity was founded on the land that is tra traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, in conjunction with uh, land acknowledgments, uh, Feminuity likes to elevate contemporary Indigenous voices and struggles by spotlighting an Indigenous creator, author, activist, or artist. Uh, this week we're highlighting the work of Gwen Benaway, uh, pronoun she, her. Gwen is a trans woman of Anishinaabe and Métis descent, a poet, and a PhD candidate in the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. Uh, Gwen is the recipient of the Governor General's Literary Award in Poetry for her third collection, Holy Wild, which is pictured here, which explores the intersection of Indigenous and transgender identities. I'll be sharing uh, a link to a reading of Holy Wild by Gwen that I encourage you all to engage with after our webinar. Awesome, thank you, Keith. Um, so, so hi folks, uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Saska. My pronouns are she and her and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Feminuity. Uh, so at Feminuity, we're a full service diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy firm. Uh, we work with everyone from pre-revenue startups through to, to Fortune 500s, working to embed all of these sort of efforts into the actual core of what organizations do. Uh, Feminity was inspired uh, very much by PhD research that I did many moons ago, um, looking at why we need equity-driven lenses when we're designing any type of technology or sort of innovation system. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Plummer. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm a consultant here at Feminuity. Um, I, my undergraduate majors were in sociology and gender and sexuality studies, and I just recently completed uh, my master's in social policy. Um, before uh, Feminuity, I worked with uh, LGBTQ2 plus research institutions and workplace advocacy org organizations, and I'm happy to be with you all today to share some of the insights that I have and uh, with Feminuity. Okay, cool. So just to sort of manage expectations with folks, um, we're going to be chatting about sort of four major areas. Uh, so to start, we're going to talk about what it looks like to build a shared language around LT LGBTQ2 plus um, terminology. And then from there, we're going to chat about what some leading policy practices might actually look and feel like. Uh, we're going to talk about how HR and people leaders can be really intentional with designing LGBTQ LGBTQ2 plus in inclusive benefits. And then we're gonna chat about what it looks like to actually co-create a culture of belonging and inclusion within your, within your organization. Um, so as Sarah said, we're gonna kick off this webinar with a brief overview of LGBTQ2 plus terminology. Um, many of you probably know or perhaps identify with some of the terms we're gonna go over, but it's important that we understand the breadth of diversity and experiences in the community. Um, it's not only important to have a baseline knowledge of sexual and gender diversity, but to be aware, of the, be aware that different segments of the LGBTQ2 plus community face unique struggles in the world and workplace that we need to be intentional about being inclusive of across the board. So the list we're going to go over today is by no means comprehensive. Uh, language is constantly evolving and we recognize that and words dealing with identity hold a specific importance to those that embrace a particular label. So I encourage you all to always listen to and prioritize a person's self-understanding over a standard definition that uh, often sacrifices complexity uh, for the sake of being more concise. So we're gonna start off with LGBT, you know, the basics, so to speak, of uh, the community. Uh, these are likely terms that you're all familiar with, but just for like a brief uh, overview, uh, lesbian is a term referring to women whose enduring physical, romantic, and or emotional attraction is to other women. Uh, some lesbians may prefer to identify as gay or as gay women, which brings us to our next term, gay, which is a term referring to people whose in enduring physical, romantic, and or emotional attractions are the people of the same gender. So like gay men or gay women or gay people. Um, sometimes lesbian is the preferred term for women, so be aware of that. Um, next, we have bisexual, which is a term referring to a person who has the capacity to form enduring physical, romantic, and or emotional attractions to those, to people of the same gender and uh, people of different genders. Um, people may, bisexual people may experience this attraction in differing ways and degrees over their lifetime. And we often shorten this to just bi. And then finally, we have transgender, which is an umbrella term referring to persons who, ident who identify with a gender different than the one they were assigned at birth. This is often shortened to trans. Um, it's important, an important part of this definition is the idea that someone who is trans is assigned a gender at birth, not born a gender. Assigned gets at the socially constructed aspects of gender and more clearly calls out gender as something that we're categorized with, sometimes not necessarily to our own self-understandings. Um, at birth, a doctor essentially looks at your anatomy and makes a guess at what gender you'll grow up to be and will move through the world as, but that's what it is, it's just a guess. If the guess was correct, which it is for many of us, then uh, you are cisgender and you identify with the gender you were assigned at birth. But if this guess was not correct, you're transgender. The next big term to cover is queer. Uh, queer is a more complicated and expansive term with multiple meanings uh, worth elaborating. Um, individuals often use queer as a shorthand way of referring to LGBTQ2 plus individuals as a whole group. Uh, so it's like kind of uses umbrella term for the whole community. Uh, queer is not so much defined by what it is, but rather by what it isn't, uh, conforming to societal norms and expectation for performances and behavior surrounding sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, queer is often used to challenge the idea of labeling itself, to call into question the societal structures which create, shape, and impose certain identities on people. Uh, individual people who identify as queer often challenge the idea of monosexuality or the attraction to only one gender because of the fluidity of identity. 
Uh, likewise, genderqueer individuals challenge the idea of the gender binary. And I'll pass it off to Sarah to go over a few other terms. Okay, cool. So the next uh, term that we want to chat about is intersex. So intersex is an, is an umbrella term that refers to folks who carry variations in the reproductive and sexual anatomy that differ from what is traditionally considered to be male or female. So these differences can be relating to external genitalia, internal re reproductive organs, chromosomes, hormones, and other secondary sex characteristics that develop later in our lives. So the next term is two-spirit. Okay. So two-spirit is an umbrella term uh, proposed in 1990 that bridges indigenous and Western understandings around uh, gender and sexuality. So two-spirit refers to another gender role to believe to be common among North American indigenous folks, um, one that had sort of a proper and respected position in, in many indigenous societies. So each nation's understanding of sexual and gender diversity varied widely and was grounded in different types of spiritual beliefs. So throughout the world, there are a number of non-Western queer identities that differ from Western conceptions of gender and sexuality, such as um, Hijra in India or the Fafafini in S uh, Samoa, which get at how systems of sexuality and gender can vary by culture and are absolutely not absolute. So the next word is asexual. So an asexual person does not experience sexual attraction. So they are not drawn to people sexually and they do not desire to act upon attraction to others in a sexual way. So unlike celibacy, which, which is an act of choice to abstain from sexual activity, asexuality is an intrinsic part of someone's actual identity, just like other sexual orientations. Um, and asexuality uh, is also, it's important to understand it as a spectrum. So some people identify as demisexual, for example, meaning they only experience sexual attraction after an emotional, emotional bond is actually formed. The next term is pansexual. So this describes a person who experiences enduring physical, romantic, and or emotional attraction to other folks of all gender identities and expressions. Uh, so many folks who identify as pansexual actually just shorten it and use the language of pan. Um, and so this is similar for some to bisexuality or a bisexual identity, um, but it is intentional in the prefix to be trans inclusive and to avoid any references that are specific to a binary understanding of gender. So on the screen here um, is a graphic, a bi plus graphic. So it's a word cloud with many, many different words um, that express different ways someone might potentially refer to themselves that indicate that they are attracted to more than one gender, um, such as fluid, bisexual, pansexual, and queer, among, among many other words. For example, no labels is a good example too. So they all, all of the words on the screen here all have slightly different meanings, um, but ultimately they refer to experiences of non-monosexuality. So one way to refer to people attracted to more than one gender that is increasing in popularity, um, given the many different ways to talk about non-monosexuality is bi plus. So B-I with the, the plus additive sign. So you might say these identities are part of the bi plus community or experience um, which attempts to cohere these different yet meaningfully similar identities, sort of in a bit of a com communal understanding. Keith, do you have anything to add or offer on that? Um, yeah, just that bi plus is a good umbrella term for like people who are attracted to more than one genders because we're seeing that there's lots and lots of specific labels, but they all share maybe like a similar experience in certain ways and similar issues. So it's helpful to have like an umbrella term like bi plus. Awesome. I knew you'd have something more there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll pass it back to you for gender identity and expression. All right, so gender identity, which I want to really emphasize is distinct from sexual orientation, refers to a person's innate and deeply felt psychological identification with gender, um, which may or may not correspond with uh, the person's sex assigned at birth or the sex originally listed on someone's birth certificate. Um, related to this, but different is gender expression, which is the external display of one's gender, which can be through a combination of 
clothing, grooming, demeanor, demeanor social behavior, and other factors um, generally made sense um, on scales of masculinity and femininity. This is also referred to as gender presentation. Um, it's important to understand that one's, someone's gender identity and gender expression can be different. For example, someone can identify as a woman and express their gender more masculinely. And conversely, someone can identify as a man and express their gender more femininely. Uh, we want you all to challenge yourselves to not make assumptions about someone's gender identity until they've really clarified it themselves. Assuming someone's uh, gender identification based on visual appearance alone is not enough to really tell you how they feel inside and what their deep, innate, like, uh, psychological identification might be. Uh, a useful way to, uh, you know, really hit home this differentiation between sexual orientation and gender identity is uh, this. So sexual orientation is who you may go to bed with, which is more inclusive of asexual people who might not go to bed with anyone. Um, and gender identity is who you go to bed as. So that's really like who you are. So just like a easy takeaway to understand the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, the next term I wanna go over is non-binary. Uh, non-binary is a term referring to people who experience their gender identity or gender expression as falling outside the categories of man and woman. Non-binary people may define their gender as falling somewhere in between man or woman as something wholly different than these terms or fluid. Um, there are several other terms uh, to describe gender identities outside of the man-woman binary, such as genderqueer, gender nonconforming, gender fluid, gender expansive, agender, and bigender. Um, though these terms have slightly different meanings, they all refer to experience of gender outside the binary. Um, some non-binary people identify under the transgender umbrella and others do not. So just respect how people identify in that regard. Related to non-binary identity are gender-neutral pronouns. A gender-neutral pronoun or gender-inclusive pronoun is a pronoun which doesn't associate a gender with the individual being discussed. Um, the most common gender-neutral pronouns in the English language are they, them, theirs, uh, but different people embrace other gender-neutral pronouns uh, such as z, here, here's. Um, you probably already use the singular they in your everyday speech and don't really give it a second thought. Um, you might say, someone left their folder at the meeting. Uh, while this usage has been commonplace for a long time when you're referring to someone in speech whose gender is unknown, um, the singular they to affirm people who identify with non-binary gender identities is what's relatively new and gaining more traction and is a best practice depending on how they want to be referred to. Um, related to these uh, gender neutral ways of referring to people is the honorific mix. Um, this is similar to Mr., Miss, or Mrs., but it's gender neutral and op often the option of choice uh, for folks who identify as non-binary. So you would just say something like, Mix Smith is a great teacher. And it works just similar to like if you'd use like Mr. or Miss or something like that. Just something that doesn't impose a gender identity on someone or is non-binary inclusive. Um, we want to remember that we can't always know what someone's pronouns are by looking at them. And we'll be discussing more about inclusivity around pronouns later on. And then one of the last things I just want to share with this like LGBTQ uh, terminology section is uh, the gender unicorn, which is kind of an awesome graphic that helps sum up all these different variations across someone's biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual and romantic orientation. Uh, I encourage you all to try locating yourself on these different continu continuums. Um, while many of us take how we identify along these spectrums for granted because they align with people's and our own sexual or our, our own expectations, I should say, it's useful for all of us to appreciate that there's variation and diversity in all these different dimensions of gender and sexuality that form a complete picture of someone is in this regard. Uh, any configuration along these different uh, dimensions is possible. So just be aware that, you know, there's lots of different aspects that compose someone's like membership in the LGBTQ2 plus community and just your own relation to gender and sexuality. And I'll pass it off to Sarah to start our leading policy practices section. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you, Keith. I love the unicorn diagram. It's such a great teaching tool. Okay, so in terms of some of the different leading practices that we want to chat about, um, the first relates to um, HRIS um, and other forms. So one of our first recommendations when choosing an HR information system is to ensure that there's some level of customization on your end or on their end. 
Um, so that will actually allow you to include some of the gender designations that go beyond uh, the traditional gender binary. So some HRIS vendors actually don't allow for this, which results in the exclusion and erasure of lots of different folks, particularly non-binary folks. Um, so if you're currently on an HRIS that doesn't allow for the inclusion of non-binary gender identities or any type of customization of these fields, then we really think you should express your disappointment, you know, your feedback to these, these companies, these vendors. Um, communicate, right, what's not working for you. Um, and if, if they're not willing sort of to make these changes or if it's, you know, it's not something that's actually on their roadmap in the next six months to a year or beyond, right, we do understand that organizations, you know, these are sort of costly changes that sometimes do take a little bit of time. Um, then maybe you want to consider migrating to a new HRIS or, you know, moving the process in-house. So if for legal or if for reasons of legal compliance, you are required to collect um, binary gender information, you might consider uh, being explicit as to why you're doing this with folks um, and including additional fields for your employees to list their gender identity and chosen name as well. Um, you should also be aware that there are many countries um, and states in the US that already allow legal non-binary gender registration. So some of these places include Denmark and India, Germany, Canada, New Zealand, California, and so forth. Um, and, and others um, are emitting non-binary gender designations that don't align with prevailing legal nomenclature in certain instances. Okay, so here on the screen um, is an example of what a, per, perhaps a more inclusive um, UX design might look like. Um, so there's two black boxes that sort of folks would be able to sort of hover over the different areas where they'd be placing their inputs that actually explain the reason why the organization is collecting specific gender information in such a binary way. So even these explainers, right, are a good addition if, you know, you can't make the, all of the changes that you'd like to actually see reflected. Keith, do you have anything to add or offer on, on this piece? Yes, I feel like any time that you're requiring a binary gender uh, designation, you also want to be including, you know, additional fields that people can clarify aspects of their gender identity. They may are being asked to like erase when they're like clicking one of those boxes. So leaving two additional boxes for A, like um, their actual personal gender for identification and B, their uh, chosen name or the name that might be different than their legal name. And, this, and a chosen name, you know, applies to people that might not even be transgender, just lots of different people have names that they identify with that should be used, should be prioritized, like on any sort of like company, like uh, information, like emails and name badges that like, if it's not for reasons of legal compliance, we want to do our best to honor people's gender identification and uh, chosen name in all instances possible. So just hitting that home and giving them opportunity to, you know, proactively record that so HR people are uh, and people leaders are aware of those sorts of things. Just a quick question that's come in here. Um, are there any specific HRIS platforms that are very inclusive that you'd recommend explore uh, recommend exploring? Keith, I'll, I'll start, but I, I think Keith may have some good answers on this. Um, to date, I'm not aware uh, of any that really sort of have a sort of a home run in terms of these standards of what, what we would hope for. Um, but, but granted, from our perspective, we tend to get the feedback, right? Like from our sort of our clients, we're, we're the ones who often sort of are learning about the gaps, right? And then sometimes sharing this information with different vendors. Keith? Yes, I think the goal, like, uh, in terms of, like, uh, vendors that are implementing these standards, like Sarah said, maybe not, like, a home run for most, but the really ideal is customization. So you can, like, create these sorts of best practices, like, within your system that you can customize to, like, fit, like, for gender inclusivity. I reached out to, like, one of my friends that worked on, like, uh, non-binary inclusion and something they said Workday is maybe trying to pioneer a very like non-binary inclusive platform might be in the process or I implemented that so that's one that I may be thinking of but uh I'm not I'm not completely sure I'd say if you see one ask about it and um yeah and reach out to your own vendor to see if there's customization on their end. Okay, cool. So on this slide here um, is another example of designating gender for specific purposes that differentiate between government reporting and someone's uh, personal gender identity. 
So um, gender as required, as, as Key said, for EEOC and legal reporting purposes, sex, i.e. for EEO purposes, gender for benefit purposes only, gender is shown on passport, gender is listed on a driver's license, for example. And Sarah, just before you move on from that, one more question around this um, that just came in. So if you are with a government contractor where reports for EEO1 and AAP data collects this information to ensure disparity, what do you recommend? then yeah you want to be transparent about like maybe this is the reason that this reporting agency and this like sort of reporting uh legal compliance procedure is part of it and you can communicate that in like your hris or like internal communications but then you also want to acknowledge like where this like falls short and that it's not non-binary inclusive as well so seeing like the good aspects but seeing how it could be like refined to be in line with you know the actual like diversity lived experiences i would say Okay, cool. So just a, a sort of a few more pieces around HRIS um, and other forms. So when collecting data on prefixes and titles in HR documentation or for your sales and marketing database or sort of any sort of event, conference, any form of registration, um, definitely make sure to include the honorific mix, the one that Keith chatted about just a few minutes ago. Um, and don't just write other in conjunction with man or woman um, categories include non-binary, um, a space for self-reporting, or perhaps per not, prefer not to answer options for the legally non-mandatory collection of gender information. Um, try not to use he, she, right? Like binary um, pronouns on forms or in your employee handbook or HRIS sort of generally. Um, you know, use things like the singular they that Keith chatted about or rephrase, you know, the, the language in ways that um, are just sort of more inclusive. Um, so in context, we're using the singular they might open up some sort of liability or just become not too clear. Um, then perhaps, you know, working with your legal team, look for something like, you know, the applicant or the employee or the individual, the person, whatever that sort of might look like for that specific um, utility. Awesome. One more question coming in um, around this concept. Um, I work in healthcare and we're challenged with identifying gender identity to respect the individual's preference, balance with the need to understand how their gender at birth, hormone treatments, uh, gender reassignments, et cetera, impact clinical results. Laboratory, i.e. laboratory results ranges uh, often differ by gender. Clinical alerts and guidelines are typically based on gender at birth. Any suggestions um, around this? Um, again, I think this is an offer, awesome opportunity to like, you know, uh, tell people, be explicit, why are we collecting information in this specific way? So letting people know we're not trying to like supersede like your personal gender, gender identification with like your biological sex or sex assigned at birth. Um, we're just doing this because there's actual like uh, medicinal like rationale for this. But then also in conjunction with that, you want to leave them space to communicate, you know, their pronouns, their chosen name and their personal gen gender identification, because that's going to be vital for like the rapport between like a doctor and patient or like how to properly refer and treat that patient. So both like on an interpersonal level and on a medicinal level. So just like being explicit, but also collecting, you know, the personal information as well. If they feel like they want to share. So Keith, in that instance, would you suggest say um, that folks have space to collect um, birth assigned at sex and then gender identity expression and then like all, like just as many other fields to add like more of the color and texture like do you see it as like a yes and i see it as a yes and like if it's really like essential that you know the biological sex and how you're treating someone then i think that's an opportunity for like you know to be explicit about why you're doing so again maybe using that language assigned sex at birth you know they got the socially constructed dimension of it and how it's imposed on someone it's an ex imposition it's not something that's intrinsic to someone's like identity but yeah obviously a yes and approach where you're also leaving space for people to communicate gender identity pronouns chosen name just lots of explainers right to give the con context yes yeah all right so if we don't have any more questions on hr information systems and forms i'm going to move on to lgbtq2 plus self id which um, refers to the collection of employee information uh, regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. This is often abbreviated as SOGI data, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity. 
Um, collecting data on the LGBTQ2 plus community is a crucial step in understanding the needs and challenges of queer employees at your company. Um, self ID data gives actual metrics uh, relating to the recruitment, retention, and promotion of LGBTQ2 plus employees and allows DEI people and HR leaders to set tangible goals and have like concrete numbers to advocate to leadership with. So this is important like um, program to start, you know, implementing. And vital in this implementation is that it has to be voluntary and confidential. So LGBTQ2 plus employees must be able to decide whether they want to share this aspect of their personal data and the utmost care should also be taken in making sure the data is secure and remains private. So included in this sort of like self ID program or like form that, you know, an LGBTQ2 plus person is potentially filling out, you want to include a consent form explaining how the SOGI data is handled, used and updated that notes specifically that employees, team members, peers and managers will not be able to see this designation only like a very select few of HR leaders that have to sign like non-disclosure agreements should have access to this sort of data. And you wanna add a note that the data may also be shared with others like in an aggregated form that doesn't, uh, that prevents you know, the identification of individuals but also allows you to communicate like aggregate numbers to advocate for leadership about particular like gaps and maybe inclusion and also like just giving the contours of like how LGBTQ people are faring at different levels of your organization. Um, and also important note with LGBTQ2 plus self ID programs is data privacy regulations in some countries prohibit employers from collecting such information from employees. Um, in other countries, there are specific restrictions around asking about sexual orientation and gender identity. So we encourage uh, you all before piloting this program to do uh, an audit of compliance and data privacy regulations for each country where your business operates. Um, but I want to stress that self ID is indeed possible in like most regions on a global scale, like IBM, for example, makes it possible for employees in 40 countries covering roughly around 87% of their workforce to provide their own self identified sexual orientation and gender identity identity on their IBM human resources records. So this is possible. You just want to make sure that you're taking the utmost care and making sure it's secure and legally compliant and how you're doing this. Um, you should also expect uh, significant underreporting in the initial years of these sorts of efforts when you start collecting self-ID information, as it's going to take time for employees to trust the process and the stated goals of the effort. Also, uh, we find that older generations that are used to maybe covering their identity and that weren't able to be out maybe previously and like in full force might be more reluctant to share this sort of information as well. And it's more popular among younger generations. So there might be age discrepancies in your data as well. Great, Keith, before you move on from that, uh, just a quick question on self-ID. Um, we are trying to do self-ID for the first time and are not sure whether where to start or if we should bring in a third party. Any recommendations? Hmm, I think it's definitely, I definitely think it's like a complicated like process with lots of different like legal compliance. You definitely want like an expert that like uh, knows about these things, whether they're like in-house or yes, I could like a third party just to make sure you're really like getting it right. You also just wanna do like researches because research, because there's lots of different like companies that also uh, model this sorts of thing. I'm gonna share a resource created by Out Leadership um, and the IBM case study in the chat, which maybe are like a good launching point in understanding different uh, considerations with LGBTQ. Uh, self ID. Uh, but yeah, I think a third party could be like a good choice, just making sure that you're getting this right, because you know, there's a lots of areas where it could like go awry. So you don't want to get it wrong. But you're definitely on the right track that you're trying to pilot something like this, because data is the first step and really uh, getting like tangible like numbers around things. Great. Thank you. All right. So Okay, so getting into like the logistics of self ID, I want to talk about LGBTQ self ID and gender identity. So you want to include a breadth of gender identities beyond the binary and you want to be sure to include common gender identities, particularly the different regions such as the North American two spirit that we went over before, or the South Asian hijra. Uh, you do not want to just uh, include man woman and the catch all other. Yeah, that's just that's not inclusive. It doesn't encompass like the diversity of uh, you know, identifications people might have with regards to gender identity. And you wanna be sure to limit 
um, identification with culturally specific queer identities, like the Two-Spirit or Hijra communities, uh, to people that identify with those traditions. So maybe only reveal those sorts of options if someone selects that they're part of like, you know, like and have like indigenous heritage or like South Asian descent or something like that. So you're like, um, not like having people that can't really identify with these conceptions, like being able to check that box. You also wanna allow for the selection of multiple, gen multiple gender identities an option to self-report a gender identity not listed. There's multiple terms someone might be identify with. And then you should never assume that your list is completely comprehensive. So always give people the opportunity to like use the word that best fits their identification. Uh, you don't want to include categories like trans man or trans woman. Instead, you maybe want to add a completely separate question um, asking someone if they identify as transgender. So like yes, no, or prefer not the answer for that. Um, separating trans man from man or trans woman from woman kind of furthers the idea that trans men aren't trans men aren't really men or trans women aren't really women. So you just want to you just for gender identity, identity you just want to put man or woman, and you want to consider defining gender identity below the survey question to increase clarity about what you're asking for. And the next slide will kind of like give maybe like an example of it. We won't. I'm not necessarily going to say that this is like the completely best practice like holy grail but it certainly like um allows people to select more than one and includes a host of gender identities beyond like the binary and it, it says man and woman not trans man or trans woman and prefer not the answer and self-report options so you'll see agender gender fluid gender not conforming gender queer questioning and the slide deck's going to be shared with you all after so feel free to reference this when you're like uh coming up with different options and uh, moving on to sexual orientation, collecting data on that. Uh, similar to gender identity, you wanna include a breadth of sexual identities. You know, we, we went over a lot in the terminology section beyond just heterosexual or gay or lesbian, such as bisexual, queer, and asexual, you know, et cetera. Uh, you wanna allow for the selection of multiple sexual identities and the option to self-report a sexual identity not listed, as we talked about. Uh, and you don't want to include gender identities with sexual orientation questions. Uh, you want to keep sexual orientation and gender identity questions separate. Gender identity is different than sexual orientation. So make sure you're asking these questions separate and don't be muddying the concepts or mixing them up and how you're asking the questions. And you want to consider defining what sexual orientation is below the survey question just to increase clarity. And just for some practical considerations on the next slide, here's um, a similar a similar kind of like sheet of different options that you could potentially like have again select all prefer not the answer options self report a host of identities uh, beyond gay and lesbian and heterosexual like bisexual asexual demisexual queer and questioning so just like making sure you're not siloing people like by not having that robust to live and uh, giving them opportunity to really reflect who they are like in collecting this data should we pause are there any questions that we want to sort of chat through right now? Sorry, I'm mute here. Uh, yeah, there were a few uh, that have come in, so maybe we uh, start with the top one here. Are there any statistics on companies um, and employees that actually implement these protocols? Um, yeah, there, I think there are some statistics. If you look at the out leadership um, resource that I shared in the chat, they, they actually, it's basically a study of like different companies that have implemented these sorts of things and different related statistics regarding to how they implemented it. Uh, next question here. Um, I work at, at a post-secondary institution and folks who identify themselves as trans often ex experience harassment from students. Resources and materials are distributed all over the campus to educate students to create a self and welcoming space for everyone, but there's still some individuals who aren't respectful of people's identity. Do you have any other suggestions on how else I can contribute to ensuring that folks who identify as trans feel safe and free from harassment in school or in the workplace? Um, I think that we'll definitely be getting into different trans inclusive practices, specifically in the co-creating and culture of inclusion section of our like workshop. Do you have anything to add regarding that, Sarah? Uh, th so there's a recent report um, that was led by Breton Fosbrook um, and uh, Sarah Kaplan and Jade. Jade's last name is escaping me right now. Um, coming out of um, the Gender and I think Economy Institute. Um, I think I will. I'll find it. It's it's a really great resource. It's a Canadian study, um, and it has a lot of really tactical information. Uh, so we'll we'll share that in the chat. 
Great. And then there's four questions that are all pretty similar. So I'll try and summarize them. Uh, what people are interested in is, is why, um, why would you ask this in the context of work? Why is it important to understand people's sexual orientation or, or trans status? Um, why, why, you know, why is it necessary to ask that or know that information? Oh, yeah, this is like, this is a very good question. Um, so again, this is confidential and like private information. So it's not like you're necessarily declaring this to like your entire workplace. This is something that you're reporting the HR professional. So they have data on the recruitment, retention and promotion of like LGBTQ2 plus employees. So this data is really relevant, 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 revelatory in regard to like, oh, or is there like a high turnover rate with LGBTQ employees, which would like indicate, oh, your workplace culture might not be that inclusive or like LGBTQ two plus individuals not represented in like leadership, they're all in junior level positions that might be indicative, you know, that there's like not many much room for advancement for LGBTQ two plus individuals. So data is like the first step in like understanding like the needs and gaps in a community that you can then use to like create like tailor your initiatives to make your workplace culture more inclusive and we already collect a lot of data on different things sexual orientation and gender identity is like a newer thing because it's not necessarily like legally mandated with some sorts of reporting and then also like you said sometimes are considered like i guess maybe a little more salacious or like private but like we really want to challenge that idea that like um sexual orientation or gender identity or private gender is a very visible thing you like communicate your gender like every day and you also communicate your sexual orientation very like casually when you discuss your family or like dating or the pictures like in your office so um the idea that like queer people need to like cover that kind of like uh makes them like less productive and less authentic at work and ultimately you know less effective at their jobs i would say so i say this is just like a good start but what would do you have anything to add to that sarah uh no i i plus one, everything you've said. And I guess my question to the, is sort of to, to share back a question, right? Like, so why, if we're collecting data on age or, or socialized race or, you know, some other, I guess, more traditional categories, why, like, how do you net out what's more important, right? Like, who are we to determine, like, what aspect of any one person's identity is, like, more important than, than another, Right. So we're, we're going to chat a little bit about intersectionality in just a few minutes, but I think it's really understanding like, like the depth and breadth and complexity of, of people and just, you know, how we can better support them. Yeah, and I think that's where the, the real power is, right? Once you've identified or understand the diverse makeup of your employees across these different um, demographics, um, the next step is really understanding and overlaying that on their workplace experience. So understanding inclusion to see if uh, people that identify as LGBTQ2 plus uh, feel included, feel like they belong the same way. Um, and having that data, understanding the makeup of your employees allows you to see these types of insights. Uh, so, so pictured here, uh, just getting back to the presentation, is a map of select groups of countries and the proportion of queer employees that are either not out at work or at work but covering. Um, covering refers to strategies that people use to downplay or hide stigmatized aspects of their identity so it doesn't adversely impact them in the workplace. Um, the level of outness of different employees varies significantly from country to country. We know that some in some countries, queer relationships are still criminalized, heavily stigmatized, and more likely to invite violence and prejudice. 80% um, of LGBTQ2 plus professionals in Russia aren't out. 72% in Singapore, 70% in China, and 67% in India. A lot of these countries are key markets for many companies, but like LGBTQ2 plus people don't feel comfortable being out. And this relates um, to policies around international assignments for employees. Um, so with regard to uh, international assignments, I think the most important thing is to communicate that LGBT2, LGBTQ2 plus employees will not face any career detriment if they decline an international post that's being offered to them. Um, as we said that like, uh, not only can this endanger the employees, like so like in your risk ass assessment, you should be like thinking about LGBTQ rights and their status in like a particular country, but like covering your identity can have an adverse psychological impact and impede productivity um, trans people especially might have trouble like immigrating with like having their appropriate legal documents and uh, their gender identity and gender representation aligning with those. Um, you want to provide LGBTQ2 plus employees and their families with active immigration support if they take an international post. This is especially important because 
uh, these some countries won't recognize the spouses and children of like, um, you know, same sex couples in the same way or transgender couples. Uh, and this can cause immigration headaches and make the international assignment not feasible or requiring some form of family separation. If family separation is kind of like an aspect of an international post because of like LGBTQ related statuses or any other sorts of reasons, like we recommend that you provide like an additional funds, like travel funds for like this employee to come home with family if they take this international post. And then finally, you wanna make sure that LGBTQ2 plus inclusive healthcare is available and can be, or can be continued in like an international assignment and help fill in those gaps uh, wherever possible, you know? Um, so the next portion of the presentation will deal with how you can be deliberate in designing benefits that are LGBTQ2 plus inclusive and not unconsciously creating exclusionary hierarchies or emitting salient LGBTQ2 plus concerns. Um, the first thing here we have is domestic partnership. So all benefits afforded to spouses, so healthcare and like worst place leaves and uh, survivor retirement sort of benefits should be equivalent for domestic partners. And this is important for a number of reasons. Like uh, marriage equality isn't a global reality for one, but even in countries with marriage equality, not all LGBTQ2 plus people or even heterosexual couples or different gender couples want to participate in an institution that has a history of exclusion and specific legal obligations that may not want attached to it. Um, public marriage records can also out LGBTQ2 plus people, uh, leaving them open to discrimination. Uh, restricting benefits to spouses essentially coerces employees to make a very personal decision that might not align with their values and opens them up to potential discrimination and adverse impact. So we recommend, you know, continuing domestic partnership benefits or implementing them to the equivalent of spousal benefits if you haven't already in all contexts. Yeah, another important piece um, is that workplaces need to recognize the diversity of family arrangements right within the, the queer community. So that looks like establishing family leave policies and benefits that are inclusive of domestic partnerships and chosen family, right, so that they're not restricted to spouses and legal guardians. Um, that chosen family may include um, close friends that are considered the equivalent of family, partners, extended kin, like a grandparent or close cousin, for example. Um, also, non-birth fathers, mothers, and adoptive parents should be included in all parental leave policies, too. Um, in terms of trans-inclusive health care, um, employees sh should select health care plans that um, cover gender-affirming treatments, therapies, and other surgical procedures. Um, Trans-inclusivity should be a crucial um, consideration that's on par with all other criteria. Another important area to consider um, relates to fertility benefits. Um, so a lot of these benefits are offered only after infertility has actually been diagnosed through a doctor's examination or some sort of invasive testing. Um, but fertility benefits should cover social inf infertility or infer inf infertility that is shaped by a person's relationship and circumstances rather than purely you know, a physiological sort of diagnosis. So for example, being in a same sex partnership that would not allow for conception with, with your partner. Um, so fertility benefits should cover uh, fertility preservation for trans folks um, prior to any gender affirming therapies or procedures such as freezing eggs, sperm or embryos. Um, and fertility benefits should also cover queer specific procedures such as um, IVF um, or when one person's egg is fertilized and implanted into their partner's uterus. Um, and fertility benefits should not be gender specific. All right, so the next section of our presentation and the final aspect is uh, co-creating a culture of inclusion. This will focus on tangible actions you, your department and your company uh, can take to help construct an inclusive work environment for LGBTQ2 plus people. And our first recommendation for this is to embrace intersectionality. We have to strive for intersectionality and how LGBTQ2 plus inclusion efforts uh, to ensure that our efforts do not disproportionately prioritize or benefit a certain segment of the community, like, you know, LGBTQ people that are white or LGBTQ2 plus people that are just gay or lesbian and not bi plus or asexual. Um, LGBTQ2 plus pride symbolism has evolved to reflect this need for intersectionality. We started off with the standard rainbow flag, which you'll see pictured here, which was supposed to be representative of the whole community. 
but activists found that the struggles and voices of LGBTQ2 plus people of color were left unaddressed and even exacerbated by some members of the community that weren't necessarily being racially inclusive. Um, this is where the more color and more pride flag enters the conversation, uh, pictured here in the middle, which tries to deliberately foreground um, the experience uh, of uh, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color that are part of the LGBTQ2 plus community and their unique experiences uh, through, you know, this reinvention of like this traditional symbol. Um, and then enters the flag on the far right, the progress pride flag, which builds on this initiative to also spotlight the transgender community with the blue, pink, and white stripes of the transgender flag to make sure that their stories aren't forgotten. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you just wanna be like inclusive with your pride symbolism. And on the next slide, we'll see uh, a number of companies are already adopting like um, intersectional pride symbolism. Uh, this year we saw a surge of companies opting for intersectional LGBTQ2 plus symbolism in their pride marketing. This pride month coincided with international protests against racial injustice through the Black Lives Matter movement, in addition to a continued epidemic of trans violence, poverty and marginalization, uh, particularly felt by trans women of color. Um, here are a few examples on the slide of this, including, you know, the United Nations uh, Women's Organization or the United Nations uh, Entity for Gender Equality, which used the Progress Pride flag, which includes both the black and brown stripe for racial inclusion and the blue, pink, and white stripes for trans inclusion. Um, companies and supranational organizations are increasingly recognized the importance, recognizing the importance of intersectionality and how they go about their business, support their employees, and market their brands. So like these uh, companies and supranational organizations, when using rainbow symbolism in your pride marketing or LGBTQ2 plus initiatives, you should consider using the more color, more pride flag or the progress pride flag to recognize the importance of intersectionality and how you support uh, queer employees, which you already see a lot of these companies doing. Okay, um, so another important, like, I guess, tool to consider are climate surveys. So I think like Natter and like the team at Work Tango, right, are a great place to sort of, you know, get support on something like this. Um, climate surveys can be sent out to your organization um, and show specific questions regarding queer experiences in your workplace. Um, so there's just lots of really good sort of thoughtful ways to, to do this process. So some of the tips here on this slide, I won't review them right now. This is definitely something that the team at Work Tango uh, or your, you know, your other, your preferred platform uh, or other platform w would be able to support you with too. Actually, maybe related to that, there's a, there's a question that might be worth uh, diving into now. Yeah. Um, how do you navigate a situation of highlighting to management or senior leadership that there's a high turnover rate of the LGBTQ2 plus employees without identifying who those people are? How do you promote change, share stats, and not divulge private information? Um, so again, you can like, you want to make sure you're sharing this data in aggregate form. And then you also, which doesn't necessarily identify like individuals, but you also want to make sure that if there's any specific intersection that you're capturing, like there's one or two like trans women of color in the sales department, and you talk about that, you can't really do that because that's not properly anonymized. And that's kind of like reveals like what people are saying. So I think it's also having like a critical mass of LGBTQ2 plus employees that communicating aggregate statistics doesn't necessarily reveal, you know, individuals identities. Yeah, and, and like when we do findings reports, we find that sometimes in order to protect folks who are like, quote unquote, onlys, right, within an organization that often we actually can't report on their, on their data, their experiences. So we get a little crafty, right? And sometimes we actually bake um, their experience into our recommendations. Like we find other pathways to make sure that that information is shared um, strategically, sometimes without, well, while still really, you know, protecting the individuals. So I think it's a bit of an art meets science, right? At, <laughs> when you need to sort of protect folks, but also make sure that information that's really important is conveyed. The only thing I'll add is if, um, again, if it's specific to turnover, um, you could use exit interviews as another mechanism to understand what their experience is like and, and leverage that as a, as a way to share um, those insights with senior leadership. Okay, so just so a few more pieces around sort of fostering a culture of inclusion. Um, so another piece is just normalizing the use of pronouns, um, right? So we have a couple examples um, on the slide here of how we can all sort of proactively share pronouns to eliminate confusion, to help prevent misgendering, and to signal to your employees and your clients, your partners, and 
and so forth that you're really you're working towards a really like sort of queer friendly um, and inclusive environment. I think what's really important to remember is that behind every person is a pronoun, right? So using someone's pronouns is one of the best um, ways to show uh, dignity and respect. Um, we need to prioritize their comfort. Um, and if you have trouble with someone's pronouns, then practice them on your own time. Um, and when someone is referred to with the wrong pronoun, it can certainly make feel, folks feel disrespected or invalidated um, or even suicidal, right? So it's, it's our job when we misgender or use the wrong pronouns to apologize and do better. Um, so the next few slides deal with inclusive language practices. Uh, I'm not sure if we want to go over these. Like these are all things that you can uh, look over later on. What do you think, Sarah? Yeah, I, th I think so. Like we can and we can share our um, inclusive language 101 um, resource, which is super robust um, in in the chat as well. So yeah, this is yeah. So the inclusive language 101 slide is sort of. The slides that we're going to jump over right now, plus many, many more, um, and it's a, just a really good tool for folks who are looking to just, you know, be more inclusive in their language choices. Yeah, we just want to like, we just want to emphasize that like, you know, inclusive language uh, does ask something of you. It asks you to like try, but like, you never know who you'll be signaling to that you want to be inclusive and who you might be affecting just by adopting these inclusive language practices. And it's going to take practice and it's going to feel unnatural, but adjusting your language is like a super important way and impactful way to like, you know, signal inclusion and create inclusion. Yeah. And so just a few points around um, recruitment specifically, you know, find ways to actually participate in, in queer centered celebrations, right? Rather that's pride or sort of beyond, but make sure that this isn't something that's limited to, you know, the summer months or like June, right? This needs to be a commitment and ongoing conversation within your organization. Um, there's lots of other things you consider doing, um, making sure that you're using gender neutral language in your job postings, um, that you're you're featuring your commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and sort of like queer um, inclusion generally in, you know, your policies, your practices, you could share that, you know, on your careers page and so forth. Also support organizations that do really good work, right? Figure out who, who you want to sort of sort of support over the long haul and, and be vocal about it and be really active with that. Another, uh, there's also a few other places that we just wanna quickly flag um, for folks to actually continue to consider um, like queer inclusion generally when it comes to recruitment. So that's in everything from your internship program, when you're talking about employee referral bonuses, for example, when you're looking at supplier diversity um, when you're looking at different education and training um, mechanisms for your people, there's just there's lots of different places that we want you to just sort of keep these lenses and, and continue to do more and to do better. And when it comes to ERGs, um, Keith, what would you say are the key pieces about ERGs? So if you haven't established an ERG, which stands for Employee Resource Group for like LGBTQ2 plus employees, you might have ERGs for like other communities. Uh, that should be your first step. So you wanna establish this employee resource group for like uh, your LGBTQ2 plus employees where they can have a space to like, you know, discuss different issues and have a resource like for them when they join a company. Um, when starting an ERG, you wanna make sure it has an executive sponsor who's an influential and a respected leader that can be designated to mentor and advocate on behalf of the ERG to the executive team. So making sure that their voice is actually heard, you know, on like the higher echelons of like your leadership. Um, if you already have like a, a like longstanding or like, you know, new like LGBTQ2 plus ERG to maximize their impact, you want to collaborate with other ERGs to create intersectional programming, again, embracing intersectionality and creating engaging, you know, uh, programming. Um, if you're finding that there's gaps in representation in your LGBTQ2 plus ERG, like there's a disproportionate amount of like, uh, you know, white queer people or lesbian and gay people, but not bisexual or trans people, then you want to like host targeted programming that is geared toward the specific communities that you want to make sure that they are welcome at your uh, ERG and that they can see themselves in your content. Um, if you want allies at ERG events, you want to be explicit that they can join, you know, allies might rightfully be like a little tentative and like, uh, infiltrating a safe space or something like that. So we recommend just like making sure allies know, hey, we want you at this event and you want you to learn and like uh, help us through these like different initiatives and stuff. Uh, you might consider appointing an ally ambassador position on your ERG that can help 
you know, drive like ally inclusion and stuff like that. And then you also maybe want to be explicit when allies aren't welcome at an event when you're intentionally trying to create a uh, safe space. Then finally, you want to maybe, you know, really maximize, you know, how like ERGs can help your employees by establishing mentor programs where uh, members of your ERG that might be at the company longer or occupy a more senior level of leadership can mentor junior professionals or, or newcomers to the organization, like, and, you know, getting acclimated to the workplace culture and like thriving as an LGBTQ2 plus employee at the company. And then also you want to establish reverse mentorship programs where you designate leaders or a leader from your LGBTQ2 plus ERG to mentor like, you know, executives or higher level leadership on different considerations around LGBTQ2 plus inclusion and the needs of LGBTQ2 plus people uh, at the company. So both mentorship programs and reverse mentorship programs, I think are important. Okay, cool. Well, those are like the main pieces that we want to sort of get through. So, so Natter, um, Steven, we'll, we'll, you know, open space for questions and anything you all want to chat about. Amazing. We have about four minutes left. So maybe time for one, maybe two questions. We'll, we'll go with the first one here. Uh, that's really interesting. I have a question that regards to handling issues between gender identity versus religion, for example. If an employee is going through a gender transition and another employee is not comfortable being in the same washroom due to religious beliefs, what's your recommendation for organizations to be inclusive to all? Um, this is a good question. Uh, the restroom slide went over some of the best practices, but you always want to prioritize like letting uh, people use the washroom that like aligns with their gender identity. So trans people that identify as women or trans people that identify as men should have access to men's or women's uh, restroom spaces and changing facilities respectively. For that employee that has like particular like religious obligations, uh, you know, you might have, you could recommend um, Perhaps like there's a single stall restroom that we encourage you make like all gender that they could use like to prioritize their comfort. But then also like, you know, just at home that like you're a company that's committed to like LGBTQ two plus inclusion and that uh, to maybe have like a trans employee use a restroom that doesn't align with their gender identity, A, maybe opens their up to harassment and danger and B, like just like can cause like psychological distress. So I feel like that's maybe how you could like work through that. So do you have anything to add, Sarah? I think the only thing I would add is like, to me, this is, these types of complexities are often best resolved through really good design, right? So there's a project called Stalled, which is like one of the most like thoughtfully designed sort of spaces um, to accommodate folks of like all ages, all body shapes and sizes, all gender identities, expressions, like, and beyond. Um, I'll share the link in the chat here, but this is one of the most like thoughtful design projects to really create spaces that actually work for everyone in really robust ways. So I think at a high level, you know, if you are a, an organization that's like doing renovations and things like that, like look to these leading standards around design. All right, with that, I think uh, we're up on time. So thank you both, Sarah and Keith, for such an educational presentation. I think I learn every time I talk to anyone on the Feminuity uh, team so much about this space because there is so much to learn. And thanks again to uh, Steven and the Rotango team for working behind the scenes to pull this all together. Um, as mentioned, we're going to follow up with some of the resources mentioned today along with presentation and, and the video. Um, and thanks to everyone else for uh, attending and uh, educating ourselves is really the first step towards change. So appreciate everyone taking time from their busy day to attend the presentation today. Thank you. Our, our next webinar, I, I don't know if I mentioned, is on September 24th. Um, and it's on replacing top-down change management with continuous listening. So looking forward to see folks on, on that next webinar.